Investor's Perspective on the Marketplace Network. Welcome. Come on in and sit down. I'd like you to go ahead and grab a pencil and a piece of paper because you're in for a treat today. You're watching the Marketplace Network. It's Pastor's Perspective. Of course, I'll be your host. I'm Dr. Ken. And uh, you know how we do it on Pastor's Perspective. We look for people that are really feeding the sheep, somebody that really empowers them and encourages them, but also develops fruit, really brings it out of the people. I've got somebody really, really, really good at teaching. That's his gift. He's a lecturer. He's a teacher. He's also an author. And we're going to talk about his new book, Ecclesiastics and the Glorious Revival today. And who am I talking about? The famous Dr. Pack. Thank you, Dr. Pack, for joining us today on uh, Pastor's Perspective. Now, I want to jump right into this. <clears throat> he drives a long way to be with us and see us. Let me turn over the books and see how thick it is. We'll get into this in a minute. But real quickly, I want the folk to know, this is so educational. I'm telling you, universities will take this and use this. You can use it for your, you know, Bible studies. Churches really get a hold of this. It's all the networks. I'm talking about Amazon. I'm talking about Barnes and Nobles. 40,000 retailers carry this. So you want this for yourself to help the congregation and so on going on. So what's the big deal about this book, Dr. Beck? Tell the folks. Well, first of all, uh, I wanted to say I've been in quote unquote church as a child. And uh, my mother would always take us to church. We lived in the Bible Belt in Illinois, and so oh, okay. church life was everybody's life. Mm. But then I found out sometimes what we were attending and hearing was religion Ooh. as opposed to life. And religion became bondage to a large degree. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, you know, and so what I did, because, uh, you know, I, God made me smart. I can just say that. I'm, I'm a, a lawyer. I have a doctorate degree. Uh, my mother died when I was 10. I grew up as an orphan. And I sent myself through uh, college, through law school. Passed it by the first time. And I've been a lawyer now for 50 years. Wow, 50 years. Wow. And I've been a, a, a pastor, a teacher for, uh, well, for, uh, you know, about 35 years now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But before that, you know, I just, I didn't think of myself as a member of leadership, I figured, well, first of all, my grandmother said, if you become a lawyer, you're going to go to hell. No. Wow. So I figured, oh boy, I better do something. You know, I didn't want her to put a curse on me and have that thing come through. Yeah. So, you know, I gave myself to the Lord. I, I started reading the Bible every day at age about 28. Okay. I got back. I, I tell her I ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for a while. That's called the education system. Four years college, three years law school, mm. and became a lawyer. And but there was something missing in my life, and uh, I, I realized that I had a ministry calling. I had it even as a child. I thought I was going to be a minister, child. Oh wow! I was at, at 11 years old, 12 years old. I was teaching children my own age in church, Sunday mm. school. I and people would come my. Uh, all my relatives, and we'd have a whole bunch of, we'd have relatives all the time, big family. Uh -huh. And I'd take them down a creek and baptize all of them. Oh my goodness. Or if I had my cousins over and I'd take them out in the woods and I'd, I'd, I'd make them sit down on a log or something and I would start teaching the Bible. I just loved it. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that I could learn uh, the Bible and then when I went to law school I found out it was like me studying the Bible was like me studying law. Oh wow. And then I had a memory that was uh, very, very good. God blessed me with a tremendous memory. I, I remember thousands of scriptures. But then the Lord started opening up from a, well, how do we make a change in my church? Okay. How do I change the church? Because a lot of my people are religious. They're, they're not in relationship with me. Uh -huh. And I don't, I, you know, I mean, let's face it. It was the religious people that started his road to crucifixion, even though the Romans crucified him. Okay. It was the Pharisees and Sadducees that uh, had a, a false trial against him. Okay. Uh, but of course, Jesus allowed all that himself. He laid down his life. So I don't blame anybody really. You know, thank God he did because then we yeah, have our salvation. Amen. 
But what I, what I wanted to realize that for 1,800 years now, uh, the church has been saying, get saved, repent, and have remission of sin so you go to heaven. Every time I've been at a funeral, it's uh, he went to heaven. And to heaven. Yes, we do go to heaven, but then in Revelation 21, it says that he comes back and sets up a new Jerusalem, and the new Jerusalem comes down. He sets up uh, uh, his seat of government there, and then he brings all the saints back. And at that time, 1 Corinthians 15, 23, says we get a new spiritual creation body mm, like his. That's good. And that's when we get our rewards for the work that we did after initial salvation. And, and part of that work cannot be a religious practice. It has to be a leading of the Holy Spirit uh, where we have our hearts open, our minds got to be open, wow. our emotions have to be stabilized. We have to have a hearing ear of what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us and to reveal to us. So this book is really about uh, the problem with religion and this is called Ecclesia and Glorious Revival. Ecclesia, uh, people say the word Ecclesia is translated church and I show even from Strong's that Ecclesia does not mean church, it means government assembly or, gover or kingdom uh, military, that's what it means. And so if you read like Matthew uh, 16, 18 and 19, it says uh, that he, I will build my church and the word there is ecclesia. Oh. And the word is not church. It's ecclesia. And the church means, in that context, military. Really? Means military assembly. <laughs> and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church, he said. Wow. Mm. Gates of hell. So it means military. And then, and, and, and then in uh, uh, 19, it says that, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall loose in heaven. That's military terms of binding and loosening. Okay. So I realized and then in Matthew 18, it talks about uh, government assembly where you have to make judgments whether or not someone is dismissed out of the church because of sin. Oh, okay. So there, so uh, then I realized that uh, that religion has now put in there that the whole purpose uh, is to get saved as opposed to seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay. We do not preach the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 24, 14 says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole world then the end will come. Why hasn't the world come yet? Why has he not returned? Right. Because we haven't been preaching the kingdom of God. If you listen to Jesus, his own words. Okay. In Luke 24, 14, uh, 47, I must say, uh, it says that preach, Jesus after his resurrection said, preach repentance and remission of sins. So I consider it to be like uh, the wings on a plane. Like you can't get off the ground and go up into the heavens unless you have, uh, into the heavenlies, if you will, uh, with one wing. You got to preach Oh, ball. that's good. Now, have we, had we been preaching the gospel of the kingdom, uh -huh. we would not have been uh, having a mess like we have in America right now. Ooh, that's good. Tell us about because that. Because the, the value and the mores and the wisdom from above mm -hmm. and the, the kingdom authority where uh, righteousness prevails, where yes. love prevails, where discrimination is an anathema. It's, it's abhorrent to, to God. Killing unborn babies is abhorrent to God. Uh, if, we, if we want a nation uh, that is godly, mm -hmm. then we have to start seeing, following the commandments of God. All right. Commandments of God is that we love one another. Okay. And in oh. John 13, 34, 35, it says, Jesus says, and the, 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 the I, I command you that you love one, a new commandment I give you that you love one another, and as I love you, you love each other. And therefore, he says, they shall know you by the love you have with each other. And so we, we got to practice love. The second thing is, the word, uh, where did the word church came from? It came from the King James. King James was first the king of Scotland. Oh, okay. And he was like King the fourth or something of Scotland, and then okay. he was King the first there in England. And so what he did was, uh, he took the word Kirk, K-I-R-K, uh, uh, Plutonic uh, use of that word, 
and said, uh, I want you to say Ecclesia means Kirk or church. So he wanted a Scottish word in there to make it English. Okay. And the word church does, I mean, uh, the word Ecclesia does not mean that. It means a, a government assembly and uh, assembly of soldiers. So the kingdom soldiers, you know, uh, uh, 2 Timothy uh, 2, uh, 3 and 4 says uh, that you need to be uh, uh, military soldiers right. and don't get entangled with the things of this world because you belong to the kingdom uh, uh, kingdom soldiers. Amen? Amen. And then, you know, he's, he said in, in 10, 1 to 4 and 4, he says, uh, weapons are not of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down strongholds. So it's a spiritual warfare. We're not talking about picking up guns and tanks and, and all the airplanes and and all these things. We're talking about spiritual warfare. Okay. Ephesians 6 <laughs> talks about that we had to go and put on the full armor of God. And the head plate of righteousness, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the shield plate. of faith, yeah. the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the, the belt of truth, and the gospel of that, and then the sword of the Spirit. And he said, pick that up. Then when you have done all, to stand. What's that mean? Defensively. What we should be doing as a nation, I, I've said this before, is that we should be defensive minded like Switzerland instead of being the policeman of the world. Because our Bible says defensive move. So when he says, having girded your, your loins, having put on the armor of God, stand there because Jesus will come to fight your battle. He destroyed all the works of the devil, 1 John 3 8. And he's already made, given us victory already. Right? And he's given us a new born again spirit that's absolutely perfect. First Peter 1.23 says that it's, uh, it's a perfect, you know, uh, born a seed. It's a perfect seed, non-corruptible seed, it called it. Right. Uh, Hebrews 12.23 says our spirits are made perfect. First John 3.9 says that which is born of God does not sin. Ephesians 4.24 says that uh, the new man is absolutely holy and absolutely righteous. And so then we have to get, and this book talks about it, that's not the stopping once you're born again. That's not, why is everyone just preaching the initial salvation without going forward and talking about the Romans 12, 2 requirement of the transformation of the soul? Because we've got, we have now become the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Uh, that's local church. Then we have our individually, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And we have uh, uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 21 that says we are the universal church. Mm -hmm. So we're a part of this whole universal church. <coughs> and, and, and since we, the temple of God, because you know God is omnipresent. Yes. It's not Jesus' humanity nature. Jesus' humanity nature is up sitting at the right hand of the Father and enthroned. But the, the Godhead is omnipresent. Right. So he can be inside completely in every individual. Right. Just like in Colossians 2, 9, it says that Jesus' humanity nature had the entire Godhead in, in him bodily. And so therefore we have, there, this is what this book is about. Let's get our scriptures right. Let's get to where we are, where we're speaking about the kingdom of God. If we have the full functioning of the kingdom of God, in order to make America great again, we got to make the kingdom of God uh, great again, even though it is great and always will be, we got to make it great as far as our attention is sir, uh, concerned. Uh, Matthew 6 33, Dr. Ooh, Ken good. said that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, Matthew 6 10 says, This is how you pray Thy kingdom come right now, thy will be done on earth, on earth right now, oh, wow. not in the future, right now, yeah. as it is in heaven. So if there's no sin in heaven, there should be no sin on earth. If there's no sickness in heaven, there should be no sickness on wow, earth. Wow, that's good. In other words, yes. pray for the sick. If there's no poverty in heaven, you should not have any poverty on that's earth. That's really good. I mean, Jesus said, you know, Paul said that Jesus became uh, uh, impoverished so that uh, in poverty so that we become rich. Right. In other words, rich does not mean uh, uh, for you know, for our own selfishness. That's it. Tell them. God shall supply all of our need according to His riches and glory, which means all of our need to do the ministry call that He's called us to do. That's Amen. what that means. Amen. He will. Uh, every vision will have a pro connected with, it, and that's why it's called provision. 
So we'll have provision to fulfill the vision that God gives us. Mm -hmm. And the word vision is a really word, especially in Latin, it means to take things that you see far off and bring it in close so you can see it. Ooh, did you hear that? That's, That's good. That's what vision is. And we got to have, we got to get, we got to substitute our own visions and our own self-centered uh, visions to the vision of Christ that gave us to go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and also uh, teaching them all that I commanded you. And then he says this, and lo, I am with you till the ends of the earth. Wow. Because his divine nature is omnipresent. Hallelujah. In, 18, in, in Matthew 18, 20, he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, lo, I'm with you in the midst of you. That's it, Peter. So why, why, why don't we invite Jesus, the divine nature, God, the Word, to be with us, uh, in fact, the whole God has be with them. Invite them. They are not trespassers. They don't break the law of trespass. They will not trespass our will. If we want God to be more in us, we have to ask Him to be more in us. I mean, He has That's it. eternal, <laughs> infinite love. He is the perfect gentleman. He does not trespass people's wills. If you want Jesus, if you want revival, start asking for Please, Holy Spirit, bring the revival. So the ecclesia is, we now want to say, is that is the ecclesia is the ambassadors, it's the soldiers, it's, it's the kings, it's the lords, it's the priests. These are our vocations, our engiftments by the, by the Jesus is Ephesians 4.11, which are apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teachers. The gifts of the Holy Spirit is, is uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. The gifts of the Father are uh, Romans uh, 6 through 8. So we have these different in the triune nature of the Godhead. Yes. We have all of these three giftments, but the giftments uh, are, are simply to empower us. But our purpose is our vocation. We can receive the power, yeah. you know, the Holy Spirit can anoint us, you know, Acts 10 38, to be empowered. Because the gospel of the kingdom is not mere words alone, but the power of God. That's it, teach that. Yeah. So we, in other words, you know, whenever I, I've been in, I've been in Mexico, for example, and and where the people didn't couldn't afford doctors, and we would lay hands on the sick. I mean, I've seen wow. people. I had I had a <laughs> medical doctor who was the doc, was the father of our interpreter. So I was praying for people, and people were getting healed. And she brought him over to me, and he smiled like this. He, he couldn't speak English, so she interpret. But he had two, three teeth left. His his, oh, no. his his mouth was all infected and everything. So I prayed for him. And folks, you can believe this or not believe it. I, I couldn't heal the wing of a fly. But I'm telling you what happened on that day in that miracle down in Mexico. Suddenly, all of his teeth appeared in his mouth. Wow. And by the way, I was shocked. Hallelujah. I was shocked. I was with, uh, you know, a prophet who's now passed, Richard Maiden. <coughs> yeah. I mean, miracles were coming everywhere. What do you, what was that? Did you feel the anointing? Was there just a cloud you felt like? Or uh, tell us about that. Well, when we were there that night, uh, we had people coming forth, uh, one for initial salvation. Sure. Then we had people who wanted to come to healing. And so suddenly there was a cloud. It was an anointing. It was a, it was a glory cloud, I think. Wow. It was all over. I thought at first it was fog. And I went there not to participate. I was, uh, people didn't want me to preach or anything in the, in the churches so at that time. A, a no, I'm, I'm a lawyer. We don't want lawyers in the pulpit. Are you, you kidding me? So you me? were just there to uh, I was. Support. I was there to, and so uh, when he was praying for somebody, I went and held out my hands, not even touched him. I'm praying for you, brother. Go for it, right? Yeah. And he grabbed me and said, what are you doing? Go down and pray for those people there. And I went, me? Okay, went down there. And I'm telling you, miracle after miracle happened to me that wow, night. Wow, powerful. And the next morning, I, uh, what happened was I, this guy, and they, they had church there on the Protestant do on Saturday. Oh, okay. Uh, and so the next day, which was Sunday, he said, I, he said, I want to talk to you. The Holy Spirit told me to talk to you. And I go, me? And I, you know, who am I, right? Right. And I, I mean, I had come back to the Lord and, and all of that. And I was, I was going to the traditional church. I, I found it, you know, by that time, after about five, six, seven years or something, I just went, okay, whatever, I got to have something new, God. Yeah. So yeah. I started praying something new, something happened for me, right? And the reason why I'm giving this story is I was, I was stuck in a church 
that was charismatic, but it was routine and it still had the building. And we sat in pew and then everybody else seemed like they were doing their thing. And I was sitting in pew and doing nothing. Right, I could have gone to sleep, they wouldn't even know. Wow. The point is, you, we got to get out of this religious order because wow, the that. purpose of the Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor teaches for the edification of the body of Christ, edification of the saints for the edification of the body. In other words, our vocation has got to be activated. Our vocation is key. Lord, priest, ambassador, soldier. Our engiftments are Ephesians 4, 11, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 8 through 10, and Romans uh, 12, 6 through 8. Those are our engiftments. Okay? And every gift is for the whole body of Christ. It's not, it's not for self-aggrandizement. Everyone is supposed to be evangelizing. Everyone is supposed to be a, price, a priest that has the, uh, uh, the ministry of reconciliation of a fallen man back to his God. Amen. Everyone should have a, be a Lord. And Lord is like landlord. You should have, uh, you should be Lord over the piece of land that God has given you. Amen. You see? Yeah, it's good. An ambassador, you should be going out as an example of someone who's representing the kingdom of heaven, because we are citizens of heaven, and the earth is a colony of heaven and the kingdom of heaven. So we're here, so we should go out representing the king. And so these things, and then the soldier, we should be doing spiritual warfare every day. Amen. There are people Peace with it. sicknesses, there are people who who are making stupid statements right now, uh, and there are people who uh, have given up. Yeah, yeah. Their suicide is rampant. There's people on drugs. The, I mean, we should stop all of the stuff coming in, the drugs and everything from the border. Uh, we got to get back our nation to God. And my people who are called by my name will repent and humble themselves and repent. I will hear from heaven. I will uh, forgive them their sins and I will heal their land. Amen? Can I ask you a question, Dr. I've known you for 20 years. You spoke in my meetings for five years religiously, never took a dime. And you pray for, I don't care how many people showed up. Sometimes there was 100, 120, and you'd stay until 2 in the morning. You, you were a lawyer, you had to work that day. You're the only one that prayed for every single purpose, answered every single question. You passed out what you were going to talk. This is what blew me away. He even had the time to pass out uh, in uh, what he was going to teach on so they could study with him as he spoke and prayed for every single need. Why doesn't anybody do that now? I don't know. That's what I'm trying to say. The first chapter of this book talks about the fatal attraction of the Jonathan syndrome. Now, Jonathan was the son of Saul, and he's okay. also the soul buddy of David. And he knew that Samuel had anointed David to be king. Okay. He knew the anointing was David. But Saul, because the comfort, he was the son, the son of parent. He knew he was not the king of parent, though. He knew that David was supposed to go on the throne. We'll give him that. Okay. And he and really had really I, I didn't read anything where uh, he had done anything wrong. He was a man of God, etc. Uh, fought the Philistines, uh, but when it came time to go into Adullam's cave, he wouldn't go. Ooh. He wanted to stay in the comfort of the palace, Ooh. and that is what most people who are in the religious structures are out there. If you're going to seminary, you're looking for a place to work. You're looking for a job. That's a good instead word. Instead of the that. leading of the Holy Spirit. How can you bring revival when your dedication is to that religious structure as opposed to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Wow. You, you've got to get out of it and realize that the kingdom of God is run by the Holy Spirit because He has jurisdictional authority right now here oh, on earth, wow, wow, wow. even though the entire Godhead is here. They gave Him through the church age. That's why they allowed on the day of Pentecost for the Holy Spirit to come. He runs the... Now when Jesus returns, He'll be the King of Kings. So we, we need to, and this is what this book is about. There is, there is, there are great pictures in this book, actually. Yes. You enjoy the pictures. Amen. I mean, I, you, I, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. So we have pictures like that. There is, there's a first chapter that talks about the, this one here, the bread basket of surplus kingdom. Every time that the Holy Spirit does a miracle, He always gives more than enough to do it. Just like when He fed the 5,000, he had 12 baskets full of bread and fish that was left over, and that's called the leftover anointing. Can you play for a blessing, because we're running out of time. For yeah. anybody that buys this book, you can go anywhere and get this. Amazon, Bonds and Nobles. Please, Dr. Fly, bless the people for yeah. buying your book. Well, Father, I just, I wrote this book not to be famous, not to be rich, we or anything that. like that. that. 
I wrote this book, Lord, because you said, if you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. That's it. And who the Son makes free is free indeed. I ask Thank you that you can take this book, you will read things you have never read before. That's true. And it's right out of the Bible. That's it. And that you can apply those into your life and experience liberty and freedom. It's not the Constitution of the United States that will give you your freedom. Yeah. It's the Bible that will give you freedom. Because it's written by who, who is truth. And his name is Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and life. If you want to give up your existence and start living a life abundantly, then you need to become the servant and the servanthood and how to reach that purpose of being a servant in the kingdom of God is in here. Every pastor should read this book and apply it to their congregation and then send them out. Let them evangelize. Send them to have a church structure to meet in a church building. We should meet in the highways and the byways well and start preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the remittance of repentance and remission of sins together. Amen. Amen. Now, Dr. Pax got a powerful teaching and videos on the Marketplace Network. It's Bibitarian Ministries. You'll see Dr. Pax's uh, uh, thumbnail, his picture, and there's a lot of teaching that he doesn't do. That's on the three books. That he, this third one's coming out next month in April, but the other two are on sale right now, so you can get them in any one of your bookstores. But it's very imperative that you watch his teaching so you know what he's talking about, so you know it's true. So when you make this investment for this book, you'll know it's a well uh, investment for C. I want to say one more thing real quick. It's very expensive to be on TV. Help Dr. Pack stay on TV. Send the, his information right there on the bottom of the screen. His uh, Zell. Please so generously. If it's a ten dollar of the widow's mite, so be it. If it's twenty five, fifty, a hundred, doesn't matter. But it'll help him stay on. It's very expensive to travel, to stay on TV, and write these books because he's not only a lawyer, but he's got to do the books too, so we can get him out. He's got like thirty five to go. So please help him to do this. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Dr. Ken, the great Dr. Pack. We'll see you next time on Pastor's Perspective. God bless. Pastor's Perspective on the Marketplace Network.